previously on Historical Geocaching. My wife and I are exploring Jamestown Settlement, a living history museum in southeast Virginia. Most recently, we've been touring a recreated Indian village called Paspahaga Town, talking with interpreters and learning what life for the Powhatan Native Americans was like. around the age of 16 and the men are expected to hunt, fish, and go to war. We get two accounts of its range from the English, which are fairly vague. They say at 120 yards they hit their best random shots. Can an arrow kill you at 120 yards? Yeah, sure, depending on where it hits you. What can you do if you see it coming at 120 yards? <laughs> Move out of the way. It's not moving nearly as fast as it was back at 40 yards or so where the English say the men reliably hit level or near their mark on a target. So most historians assume that means hitting a shield or a dinner plate, pretty big one, reliably out to not quite where that orange cone is, but in that direction. Am I a bigger target than a shield or a dinner plate? Yeah, so hitting a man-sized target may be more reliably to 50 or 60 or 70 yards, depending on the particular archer and all that kind of stuff. And the arrows, will be a whole lot like some of these here. You will see simple blunted and sharpened tips for squirrels and rabbits and birds. You'll move into bone and stingray spines for gar or for fish and birds and medium game. And then for big game, you're gonna see these nice stone triangular points here. How many of these do you think it would take to bring down something like a bear? A lot. A lot? How many? Depends on where you shoot them. If most of the men can hit a shield reliably at 40 yards, this arrow is moving about 140, 150 feet a second at that distance. There's nothing compared to that musket ball, but it's spinning like a rifle bullet, and some of these teeth can be finer than a steel knife edge. So when it hits here, it's going to twist about halfway in, shredding its way. And let's say you're not a bear, but a colonist, a soldier. You find one of these things in here all of a sudden. What are your options? What are you most likely to do immediately? Uh, reach down and snatch on it. Why is that bad? There's a whole bunch of stuff in here, like your heart and lungs, that you should probably leave in there. What if I look down at this thing, and I just can't believe my luck that this would happen to me, and I'm just looking at it for about five seconds? What's going to happen? There will probably be another one right behind it, because that's about how long it takes to load and shoot that bow again. What if I level my musket and I'm looking around for who that was and I'm grabbing powder and I'm pointing over here and I'm pulling swords, what's happening? This thing is rocking around like a loose saw blade in here, which is bad for you. It's your only real option, snap it off. If you're around later, someone will either have to try and dig it out or push it through. So one can certainly be plenty, but the colonists will also learn that if you're well armored up and you only get hit in the arms and legs, you might survive 10 or 12 before you go down. It just depends on their placement things that they do or do not hit. One last thing I can do to make the arrows a little more deadly, what do you think that might be? Yes, and the only passed down poison we learn is from a Rappahannock man, this tribe of people still around here in Virginia today. And in the 40s, they say this man of theirs lives in the woods and keeps a lot of the old traditions. You take a deer's liver, pulverize it, put it inside the stomach, let it rot for about two or three days. Find a nice, rattlesnake out in the woods and convince him to strike the bag, repeatedly filling it with venom as well. He says, leaving your arrows in this mixture is certain for the killing of a man. So, very basic to this weapon. He 
You can shoot it about every four or five seconds with some skill. It's nice and light. They say you can move tree to tree, defending yourself, leaning out only to shoot, and then leaning back, not giving away where you are or giving much of a target to your enemy. One arrow can certainly be lethal, but placement is fairly important. And your range for hitting a man reliably is probably somewhere in the 50 or 60 yard range. Uh, it doesn't give away where I am. It's pretty simple technologically. Uh, it works pretty well in the rain, but strong wind is a bit of a liability. Um, and I don't worry about blowing up at any point, which is convenient. So far, we all stopped in for the last bits of our uh, comparative weapons demo. Yeah. yeah, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Of course, thanks for coming to see us. So I'm curious, what's your your red? So this here is what's called uh, actually a roach headpiece, and it's something that you'd actually see variations worn from the Great Lakes area all the way down to maybe like East Texas. Um, worn generally by men of status. They say war captains and some of the chiefs as well. And you can think of it uh, somewhat the way the duke or a noble or a lesser noble in England or France might wear a small crown as a symbol of their office. Mm -hmm. um, and this one, these are generally made from the tail of a deer. All the fur, the long fur from the deer's tail is plucked off, and obviously after they've hunted the deer and are tanning the hide. It's dyed and then tied up in tiny little bundles, one after another. You might see one or two hundred bundles in a, in a roach like this and they're sewn onto the base, which is either um, cloth or, or fabric or, or rope base, or sometimes leather, to make a nice crown. Um, some of them would be left uncolored or treated different colors, but red is the most common. Sure. So the paint you have on your face, mm -hmm. is, does, does that denote rank in society, or was it just general war paint? Because I know like generals in military will have you know different bars across their sleeve for um, differing ranks. Was there differing paint schemes? There are. We don't get enough information um, from the Palatine people who are still around today just because of the damage that was done to their traditional yeah. culture um, or from the English writings to say this means this and that means that. Mm. But we know a couple of basics. Commonly upper body paint in general, maybe stopping you know at the lower face, um, was worn by the people through most of the warm parts of the year. Commonly red, but other colors. Um, added to a lotion, they say, is an insect repellent, a sunscreen, and a conditioner of the skin. Mm. So it's worn for expression on a fairly regular basis um, and may have some other reasons behind it. For certain events, they would wear different colors and schemes. Um, black is worn for funerals here uh, by the Palatine, just like we do nowadays, except it's paint. Facial paint schemes seem more to do with certain special events or status on a daily basis. Um, so. In keeping with this red crown, some of my tattoos and a copper mm -hmm. chain and all, um, me being dressed similar to a war captain would be dressed, I just have this red division line and some of the streaks, which is reminiscent of the way the men would paint themselves for warfare, but it's toned down. Okay. If I was going to war in a traditional palatine dress, I would be wearing full body paint of red and black divisions and stripes and all that kind of stuff. So a simple, you know, red lower half with a black upper or divider like this, um, it's going to be a reminder that the war captains may earn their rank specifically through their success as warrior, but you're not dressed for warfare and flamboyance. Thank you. Of course, yeah.